This is Legacy Bell. Make sure you hit that subscribe button on YouTube, Amazon Music, Spotify, Apple, iHeartRadio. I'm Michael Adams, creator of Legacy Battle. My panelists tonight from the Gridiron Battle Zone, Brian King, Ball State Athletics, Paul Havocott. And we got the Director of Operations of the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame, Scott Crawford, joining us once again. <laughs> We're joined by our special guest tonight, 10 year MLB veteran. He played with the Cubs, Twins, Tigers, Angels, and Phillies. In his career, he's been top five defensively at his position in putouts, assists, double plays turn, catching base runners, catch cut stealing percentage, total zone runs, and range factor. So this guy was pretty good in the field. It's catcher Matt Wallback. Matt, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Michael. Appreciate it. Hey, guys. Good to be here. Awesome. Awesome. So tonight's debate is going to be the greatest World Series winners from 2000 to 2009. If you've been watching our past shows, you know we've done the 80s, we've done the 90s, so we're just kind of working our way up here. As always, we'll have a Q&A uh, with our special guest, Matt, after the debate. We're going to start with the 2003 Florida Marlins. Okay, I went with the Marlins. This was their 11th season in franchise history. They had one World Series in 97, but for 2003, it weren't really that great. They finished in second place at 91 and 71 in their division. The Braves won that year. It seems like they went through a phase where they won every year, or at least were in the mix. But they had 101 wins that season. And um, the Marlins were coming off a fourth-place losing season from the prior season. Manager Jeff Torborg was – taking them into the 2003 season, and uh, they got off to a really slow start. So this is kind of hurdle number one, 16 and 22 start, and they went ahead and fired him and replaced him with 72-year-old uh, Jack McKeon, who started his managerial career in 73 with the Royals. So they're bringing, bringing fresh blood in here in the middle of the season. But uh, they had really good pitching. They had A.J. Burnett, Josh Beckett, and Mark Redman. They all actually got injured that season. So think, think about that as another hurdle. Um, Josh and Mark ended up coming back in time for the playoffs. But what, what I think that made this season so special was some of their acquisitions. They um, obtained uh, Ivan Rodriguez, gold glove winner Ivan Rodriguez. They traded for Juan Pierre. Mid-season, th that was really key, too. They picked up uh, Jeff Conine from Baltimore, and they brought up two guys by the name of Miguel Cabrera, Cabrera and Dontrell Willis from the Carolina Mudcat. They're kind of lining themselves up here. Mike Lowell and Derek Lee actually led the team with home runs that year, 32 and 31 respectively. And um, Luis Castillo batted 314. Juan Pierre batted 305. Ivan Rodriguez, great catcher stats, 297, 16 home runs. Uh, for pitching, you know, we had um, Brad Penny, Carl Pavano, Mark Redman, Dontrell Willis, D-Train, Josh Beckett, uh, if you remember him. <laughs> None of the pitchers that season were overly dominant. Josh had a 304 ERA, led the starting rotation, but was 9-9. Nine and nine. Um, D-Train and Mark Redman had uh, the best records, 14-6 and six and 14-9. and nine. So they go into the playoffs – and they fit, uh, face off against the division-winning Giants. So this is the first division winner they play. They won 100 games. Um, and they, the Marlins actually dispatched them pretty easily, won in four games. So it brings them to the Cubs. Cubs kind of seemed to be a team of destiny that year. They hadn't won since 1908. The series was kind of back and forth. A lot of runs being scored. Uh, they split the first two. Cubs kind of take control. And if you guys remember, it would have been um, – I guess, game six, where we're introduced to a character named Steve Bartman, and that's probably a subject for a, another time. But uh, Cubs were headed in hand. They were leading 3-0 in the top of the eighth, one out. Steve touches the ball that uh, Louis Castillo hit, I think. And um, Moises Lou ends up saying, I, I, I would have never been able to catch that. Then he changes his mind and says he could have, was just trying to make Steve feel better. But after that, it was lights out. Cubs fall apart. Marlins win that series, and then they go on to the mighty Yankees. And so we, we kind of know back then from memory who the Yankees had that. They had uh, Giambi, Boone, Clemens still was pitching, Jeter, a uh, bunch of all-stars. Their payroll was like $148 million, I think, compared to the Marlins' $48.8 uh, .8 million that year. Uh, they split, I think, the first – two games, and then it kind of became the Marlins after that. They end up going on to beat the Yankees in uh, six. And so that's kind of the story of the Marlins. And I think my point overall with picking them 
is just everything they faced during the season with the manager change, the injuries, and going up against three division winners, two of which had over 100 wins, and the payroll, man, so low. It just came together one season, flash in the pan, and it was done. In typical Florida Marlins fashion, they dismantled the team right after that. I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. So, Matt, I have to ask you about Bartman. In your opinion, did maybe Moises Alou blow it a little out of proportion or, or you know, what were your thoughts on that play? Yeah, I remember that series and I remember that play in particular. That was my last year playing in the big leagues and I was in Florida actually at the time in Lakeland. I just got hired by the Tigers to manage uh, their West Michigan team in 04. And I remember watching that play and, you know, playing at Wrigley Field, the uh, the energy there gets so amped up and there was so much excitement. I can certainly see where Moises was coming from. I don't recall him kind of going back and forth on the story, but uh, certainly just the drama of it all was something that was certainly remembered. And that 03 team with the, with the Marlins, they had a good mix of players. You know, they had a good mix of younger players and veteran players, uh, in particular having Pudge behind the plate. Um, I think I remember that uh, when JT Snow was – trying to score that run there in Florida and, and Pudge tagged them out and had the ball. It was kind of an exciting play there. Um, but it was just an exciting thing. You know, I, I think, I think Paul's right. I think with the, uh, you know, the manager change there and the low payroll, it's something that certainly is, is an overlooked measure. And then also the fact that they did go on and uh, they, they revamped that whole team and just completely cashed out and sold everything. But uh, a lot of good things had to happen. I think, as I recall, I think Beckett pitched a game there in the playoffs. Were they playing the Braves that year? Was there, was that part of the series? They have to get through the Braves. Yeah. I don't recall, yeah, but I remember there was the Braves. They went through the Giants and then they hit the uh, Cubs there. That was what their second okay. series was. Yeah. But I was it, I think there was a game where maybe Beckett was pitching. Maybe it was a different year, even where he was getting a, like a two feet off the plate. And, um, but I think he was a younger player there. And then the D train too, you know, like I said, they just had a good mix of guys and, uh, you know, Jeff Conine and then Mike Bowl and, uh, just good ball players, you know, and, and when it comes down to the playoffs, it comes down to the little things and certainly the situational hitting back then was a big deal. And, and, um, and it was just a different brand of ball, but, uh, kind of a Cinderella story for them for sure. And, and let me ask your opinion as a catcher, uh, Dontrell Willis took, took the league by storm there. He was a, a, a big addition a, a, a for a little while there. What, what do you think of his mechanics? Like as a catcher, is that changing how you're going to approach catching the ball when it's coming at you because of his mechanics? Well, I mean, you have to figure out their release point and their timing. And he had that big, big leg kick. Um, yeah. And and once you get used to catching guys and you do a lot of that work in the bullpen and things, you, you, you kind of get a feel for how to shift your eyes. And um, there's certain things that you can look at on the pitcher. Each guy's a little bit different and then be able to shift your eyes to their release point. Um, yeah, but you, you after a while, once you, once you play at that high level, you, you kind of figure it out. And uh, you, you develop that relationship not only with their mechanics, but also with their personality and their their makeup and their mentality, even so much as – how hard to throw the ball back to him, how long to hold the ball before you actually throw it back to him. So there are certain things that as a catcher, you can make that pitcher uh, click. And I think D train at that time was pretty, pretty locked in and had that sort of effective wildness about him as well as just all the moving parts that could be difficult for a hitter to pick up. Well, let's move on to 2004. All right. 2004 Red Sox managed by Terry Francona. Uh, they went 98 and 64, finished second in the AL East. This team featured catcher Jason Veritek, who batted 296, 18 homers. Um, first baseman Kevin Millar, 297, 18 homers. Second baseman Mark Bellhorn, 17 homers, 82 RBIs. Uh, shortstop, they have Pokey Reese. Um, you know, he, he kind of had to do his thing because no more Garcia uh, Piara was out. Um, then you had third base, you had Bill Mueller. Batted 283. And you get the left field, Manny Ramirez, 43 homers, fifth overall, 130 RBIs, fourth overall, uh, batted 308. And you had a great center fielder, Johnny Damon, 20 homers, batted 304, a little bit of speed there, 19 stolen bases. Uh, right field, you had Gabe uh, Kapler, batted 272. Then at DH, another big home run hitter, big poppy, David Ortiz. 
uh, 41 homers, which was eighth overall, 139 RBIs, which was second overall, about a 301. Then you had coming off the bench, I mean, you had guys like Kevin Euclid, uh, Orlando Cabrera, Doug Mirabella. I mean, this team was just stacked. Uh, overall, they had the most runs, second in hits, most uh, doubles, best batting average, best slugging percentage, most total bases. Uh, and then you can look at the pitching staff, and this this pitching staff has some big names. I mean, you had Kirk Schilling. Uh, 21 and six that year, the most uh, wins overall. Uh, he had 3.26 ERA, uh, 203 Ks, which was ninth overall. Ended up being Sports Illustrated Sportsman of the Year. Uh, then you had Pedro Martinez, 16 and nine, uh, 390 ERA, 227 Ks, which was sixth overall. And then they switched it up on you. They they gave you a uh, knuckleballer Tim Wakefield, who went 12 and 10. Uh, Derek Lowe, 14 and 12. And then when your fifth starter is Bronson Arroyo, that's still that's pretty good, you know, 10 and 9. Uh, then coming out of the pen, you had Keith Folk, 32 saves. That's pretty good. And you had, you know, a guy like Mike Timlin, who did a nice job eating up a lot of innings. Uh, so all, all together, third in the RA, third fewest walks, uh, second in Ks for that unit. Um, you know, so now you get into the playoffs. This team, you know, immediately dispose of pretty talented uh, uh, Anaheim Angels team, three nothing in the ALDS. Then came the epic ALCS versus the hated Yankees. Uh, the Red Sox were defeated by a combined score of thirty-two to sixteen as they lost games one, two, and three. No team had ever come back from being down three zero, so it looked like the curse of the Bambino was going to live on. Uh, but this team was a group of survivors, and they really defined themselves in this series. They outlasted the Yanks in games four and five, both of which went to extra frames. And then game six, uh, you know, Kurt Schilling with a ru uh, ruptured sheath around the tendon in his ankle, creating a legendary bloody sock. Uh, he battled through the, that adversity and pitched a gem in game six, uh, forced the game seven, you know, Boston's bats finally came back alive as they achieved the, you know, the unprecedented uh, postseason comeback, beating the Yankees. Then, you know, the World Series was almost a formality. I mean, they swept the Cardinals. They allowed just to combine three runs in the final three games. So it just took a pretty darn good team and just took them out real quick. Uh, this was a, you know, a team of destiny in, in every sense of the word. You know, you had the, the, Many, many decades that they had not won a World Series. They exercised that Yankees demon on the way, um, which, which is like so poetic. And of course, you know, this, this uh, you know, spawned a pretty good Jimmy Fallon, uh, Drew Barrymore flick as well. So uh, fever pitch. So this, this had a little bit of it all. I think this was going to be right in the running for number one. So players are very superstitious, Matt. I mean, the curse... I don't know if we consider it a real thing or not, but do did the players, by any chance, did you know of any players who thought that that was a real thing? And something Brian didn't bring up was the bloody sock uh, for shilling there. That was oh, a yeah, big moment. Yeah. Oh, you did? Okay, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was a big moment in the World Series. But, uh, you know, a team coming back from 3-0, absolutely incredible. They got to be a good team. So your, your thought on, on the Red Sox? Yeah, yeah. Um... Well, sure. I mean, the curse of the Bambino was something that, you know, we all we always talked about. And, um, you know, you have that. It was that lore. Game four, Dave Roberts, was he pinched ran for Trot Nixon. And it was the ninth inning. And Rivera was pitching. And, uh, you know, the Red Sox were down two to one. And uh, he stole that base with, with Rivera pitching. And that really was a tie that turned, too, and, and ended up, you know, making a big difference in that game and then the series. And then also legend has it that um, – I think Kevin Millar, before that game, I think some the whole team or a lot of the guys on the team did a shot of Jack Daniels. And so, um, you know, that I think kind of carried on throughout the rest of that series. And they, they just had all sorts of great chemistry, you know. And it's amazing how much momentum can mean a great deal in a team's success or, or failure. And they they quickly caught that momentum shift and just rode it. And it was one of those things that, as a player, 
uh, and a baseball fan, you could kind of see that, oh man, something's starting to happen here. And then just everything really started to uh, go the Red Sox way. And then, um, you know, the rest is history. So a lot of, a lot of legendary stuff there, especially with the shilling incident and, um, and just those, that wild bunch there with man, Manny Ramirez. And they, you know, they had just an eclectic group of guys and, and it was just a well-run ball club and really exciting. So do you think that they were that good or they just get hot at the right time? Uh, both. I mean, they were that good and they had that chemistry and, and the pieces just all fit together at the right time. And, you know, certainly you have to be good to play at that level and on that stage. And they were just, uh, they had no fear. I think when, as a baseball player, either individually or as a team, when you're playing without fear and you're focusing on one pitch at a time and you don't really care, but you do care. I mean, obviously you want to win, but you're not so attached to everything. You don't feel pressure. You almost feel like you have nothing to lose. When you're in that position, good things happen. You're able to slow the ball down. The ball bounces your way. You get the good breaks. I mean, the baseball gods are looking after you and you just roll with it. So I think it's a combination of a lot of things. And um, certainly the fans in Boston were a big part of it too. So we're going to go to the 2008 Phillies, managed by Charlie Manuel, 92-70 and 70 record. Uh, this team, I, I know I got a big hill to climb here tonight to try and win this one, but uh, in the playoffs, they only lost three games in the entire playoffs. They took out the Brewers 3-1, the Dodgers 4-1, and the, my, my Tampa Rays four games to one. One of the, that final game was a rain delay game, so, you know, that threw a little spoke in it there, but in a formidable starting lineup, which is a mix of power and speed um, that, you know, some of the other teams might not have had that we're talking about tonight quite as well as this team. We got Ryan Howard with 48 homers. Utley and Burrow both had 33 apiece. Jason Worth chipped in 24. And then you go to the speed. You got Jimmy Rollins with 47 steals. Victorino with 36. Jason Worth with 20. Um, and Victorino and Rollins were both were gold glovers too. Um, so they were a very, very solid lineup from top to bottom. Um, I, I go into their rotation and I don't want to say it's like a weakness because it, it wasn't. I mean, obviously they won the World Series and they were dominant in the playoffs, but compared to some of the other pitching staffs we're talking about tonight, I'd say it's a little less. Um, but we got Cole Hamels. He had a solid year. And of course, <laughs> the ageless wonder, Jamie Moyer, at this point in his career, he's 45 years old. He goes 16 and 7 with the 3.71, 45 years old. And he. <laughs> He goes on and has a better year the next year. Just kept going there. Um, but the, the real strength of this team um, was the ninth inning. And, and that was when you got to the closer, Brad Lidge. Um, just a phenomenal season. I think he was runner-up maybe for the Cy Young that year. But 2-0 with a 1.95 ERA, 41 saves, almost a 3-1 to strikeout ratio. So – at that time, if you got to the ninth inning and you had the lead, the, the series was over because this was this was Lidge's prime year, and uh, he was uh, in the MVP voting too. So he almost won quite a bit of hardware there. Um, he was just basically unhittable. So the 2008 Phillies, they, they didn't have a lot of drama other than some drama with the Mets, which started before the season. They just kind of worked their way through and, and – got to the playoffs, took care of business pretty easily. Uh, there, was, there was never really a challenge. So, Matt, I mean, the team didn't face any challenges. They're, they're also not um, – they're not the Red Sox and Yankees, so they don't get the the hype or the play that, that comes with that. But, uh, you know, your, your thoughts on Phillies and, and just Jamie Moyer. I don't know if you came across him at any point in your career. What, what do you think of that guy? Yeah, I did. I played with Jamie in the Cubs organization uh, when I was coming up with them. And uh, that was back in maybe 1991 or two in spring training. Um, just, a, just a true pure pitcher. You know, he could read swings. He had the ability to pitch below hitting speed. Every now and then he'd run it in on your hands. He had a good change up. He kind of knew what was coming. Um, but just a, a gritty competitor, a guy that you would uh, you'd just love to have on your team. Good teammate. Um, and then I think that Phillies team had good pitching and defense. They had speed. They had power. 
you know, so they had all the components to uh, put it all together. And then, you know, the chemistry of that team as well seemed to really make them gel. And you heard what he said, 1991, he played with Jamie Moyer. And I'm talking about a team. I think it, two- was, I think it was 91. I, I don't know. It was sometime in the early 90s, I can remember. He was he was in the big leagues and I was in the minor leagues. But, uh, you know, I had a chance to catch him. I don't I don't know if that was the exact date. But back then, yeah, I was. He, I think he, he was with the Rangers, too, at one time before that. But, boy, he had a long career. Excellent. In fact, real quick story about Moyer. Yeah. Um, when when – Facing him for, uh, you know, when he was pitching for the Mariners, he had this little, he had a couple tricks that he'd do. Um, he would have a ball and then he'd, he'd step off the mound and he'd shake it to the umpire like he wanted a new ball. And we were told as hitters, don't watch him throw the ball back into the catcher. Because what he'd do is he'd actually do like a little bit of a skip and a crow hop and throw it as hard as he could into the catcher to get a new ball with the idea that he would mess up your timing with that. And so it was one of those things that you, it was a little gamesmanship, you know, he'd kind of whip it in there as hard as he could to kind of throw off your timing. And then he would do this little trick. I don't know if anybody ever caught him do it, but he'd be in the stretch or the windup and he'd actually take his left foot and he, instead of keeping it on the rubber, he'd actually step up about a foot and then lift up his leg and throw the ball. So he was real crafty, man. You talk about a crafty left-hander. He'd kind of sneak in front of the rubber when you'd least expect it. So just throwing you off and things like that. It was a gamesmanship. And then, I remember we were playing against him when I was with the Angels, and he'd go out and he'd watch all of us hit batting practice and just try to get a game record or, or a feel for how he was going to face us. And Gary DeSarcina was our shortstop at the time. And in batting practice, he knew Moyer was sitting there on the, you know, on the top shelf watching him there in their dugout. And DeSar would just hit everything the other way. He was like fighting the ball to hit everything to right field, everything to right field. And so Moyer saw this. So in his in his game plan, he's thinking, okay, this guy's going to try and shoot me the other way. And Desar set him up. First pitch, he tries to throw him fastball inside, and Desar Cena opens up, pulls it. You know what I mean? So a little bit of gamesmanship went against Moyer that time. Let's move on to our final team tonight. It's the 2009 Yankees. Yeah, the uh, oh, I got to trade hats first. This is the uh, from my Yankees hat there. Just don't tell any of my Canadian friends because, uh, you know, they won't be too happy I'm wearing a Yankees hat tonight and cheering on the Yankees. Um, basically, I, I mean, the Yankees won 103 games in in 2009. They had the best record, the most wins of anybody that in that decade. And, of course, they went to four World Series in the decade. So they were they were unstoppable, basically, through the 2000s. Uh, they won the AL East by eight games. So it wasn't really even a challenge all season long. They had uh, their team was full of Hall of Famers. I mean, you got Derek Jeter, you got A Rod, you got CC Zabathia, Andy Pettit, Mariano Rivera. I mean, their their team is completely stacked. And and then you look at the next tier of players. You know, Mark Texera with 400 career home runs, Cano with 2,600 hits, Damon with 2,700 hits, and 400 stolen bases. Matsui won the World Series MVP that year. Of course, he was the Japanese legend that that came over. Uh, their their lineup was just stacked that whole year. You look at their starting nine. They're starting nine average, 25 home runs, 288 average, and an 873 OPS. That's their average starting nine. So that, that that's impressive. I mean, and and you go down to their, you know, their rotation. I mean, again, I've mentioned Sabathia. I mentioned Pettit. You know, both will probably be in the Hall of Fame soon. A.J. Mm-hmm. Burnett had a great long career. And the uh, the guy that was supposed to be the great one, Joba Chamberlain, didn't quite turn out how he's supposed to be, but he still pitched. He pitched mm-hmm. well. So, I mean, and they won the playoffs pretty easily. I mean, they they first they they took down the Twins, obviously three nothing. Then they beat the Angels four two, and and the Phillies four two. The Phillies were there back to back years. And um, but the unique thing when you look at these teams is um, the Yankees actually played worse in the World Series than they did in the regular season. You know, their average was down, their ERA was up. Um, whereas all the other teams is the exact opposite. They they played up and they won the World Series by having better. Uh, stats than they did in the regular season so the Yankees were so good and they actually played worse but they still won the World Series which was which was kind of unique and a couple other things I have is the uh the the, the Yankees had good luck charm Eric Hinsky on their team if you remember Eric Hinsky career he was in the World Series with the Red Sox in 07 the Phillies in 08 and the Yankees in 09 so he had a little streak there of uh of doing well in the in the World Series and getting the World Series um you know, and, and they, you know, they took down um, the Phillies. You know, they talking about Pedro Martinez. Obviously, he's a Hall of Fame pitcher, but they, 
they crushed Pedro in the playoffs in the World Series. Pedro's area was 6.3, Cole Hamels, Cole Hamels was 10.4 um, in the playoffs. So they didn't, uh, they were facing some really good pitching and they, they uh -huh. tore them apart. So um, that's why the Yankees were, were unstoppable that year. And uh, Hinsky was, uh, he was on the Tampa Rays in 2008 when, when, when they went to the World Series. So there's another one for you. So Matt, the the evil empire, uh, uh, they bought their team. Um, I just every time we talk about Yankees on this, I, I got to throw that out there. They they bought their team, but you know they still won the championship. It doesn't mean it's going to mix just because you buy it. I mean, was there any holes in this lineup that that you have seen that with what he mentioned? No, I mean it sounds like that team out of all the teams that we've talked about was probably the most dominating. Um, just offensively, they had the whole package, and you know a lot of pressure to play in New York too. And so it's one thing to buy the team, but still you have to go out there and produce and and put all that pressure aside. I mean it's the toughest place to play probably with the media and just the expectations every game every year. And um, yeah, they, they put it all together and had an incredible record winning over 100 games. And um, yeah, it was domination all the way. We got a shout out to the 2005 White Sox. Probably could have been on this list tonight. Um, but uh, some of us picked with our heart and not necessarily our brains tonight. But uh, <laughs> let's move into our vote. Paul, you're in my corner. Can't take your own, guys. Uh, if I, I can't take my own, so I'll take Brian's. That Red Sox comeback is one of the greatest things I've ever seen. Okay. Brian? Um, I mean, I, I'm going to hold my nose when I do it, but, man, i got to pick the Yankees on this one. This was – they were just so dominating then. Okay. And uh, <laughs> coming into the night, I actually was thinking Red Sox, but Scott actually won me over with his argument. That lineup was uh, quite – Formidable. I do give the pitching edge to the Red Sox, but uh, yeah, that, that and over 100 wins too. That that that's very impressive. So I'm taking the Yankees. Scott. All right. Well, I can't pick my own, of course. So I'll, I'll go. I got to go with the 04 Red Sox. They were just you know dominating, and you know it was it was their year, and and it was, took them a long time to get there. And but uh, the 04 Red Sox, I'll go with. I love when we have ties going to the athlete for the final vote. That puts the pressure on you. You can, yeah. you can break this tie or you can you can take one of the others. Yeah, I'm going to go with the Red Sox. I mean, just breaking that curse and um, just the drama behind all of it and being down to the last out almost and just that that whole energy and everything and, and just the excitement that it brought the city of Boston and, and just beating that curse. I'm going to go with the Red Sox. All right, a win for the 2004 Red Sox and Legacy Battle's Greatest World Series winners, 2000 to 2009. Let's uh, move into our Q&A for Matt. Brian, you got the win. Scott, you'll go after him. Okay, so Joe Torre, Joe Girardi, Mike Sosha, Matt Matheny. I mean, I could go on and on naming big league catchers who became successful managers. So being a catcher turned manager yourself, can you explain why this transition occurs so frequently? Probably because the catcher is communicating constantly with the pitching staff and then having to take the game plans from the manager, uh, talking to the umpire, seeing the entire field, being more of a field general as our position as catcher is kind of a natural move into the manager's position. And um, just – that's really the only reason I can see it, just because you have to know how everybody lines up for defensive cutoffs and relays, and you know you have to know how to call a game, and you just have that sense of the pitching staff and and understanding what hitters are thinking. You're just right in the thick of it, so it's it's a pretty natural move to go from behind the plate into the manager's role. Scott, all right, uh, Matt, you played with. Uh, two pretty amazing center fielders in in your career. One Kirby Puckett in Minnesota, and and Jim Edmonds in Anaheim. Um, who, who would you say was a a better center fielder, and, and why? Um, well, I think Jimmy was probably more a center fielder. Kirby Puckett could play all three outfield positions. Um, Puckett, as far as a baseball player, was one of the best baseball players I ever played with. He was the only player 
um, I saw that would get an ovation no matter where he was playing, home or or away. Um, his ability to take the team on his shoulders and just carry the club was like nothing I'd ever seen. And just calling his shots, um, running every single ball he hits on the infield out as hard as he could, sprinting out to his position every time. He was just a dream to play with and a dream to watch, I'm sure, for a fan. Jimmy Edmonds made some of the most amazing catches, had an incredible arm in the outfield, um, had some of the best vision. He would actually ask me before the game, say, what sign are we using with the man on second? He would look in and see what signs I was calling so he could position himself in the outfield. Uh, just a superstar kind of player that could mash the ball over the fence, uh, almost like the game was easy for him a lot. He was great. Both of them were great. Paul. One of my favorites growing up was uh, Scott Erickson, and uh, you caught his no-hitter in 94. I watched an interview with you, and you thought it was this was one of your career highlights. Could you put us there in terms of, like, I know it's a, a feat to do to catch a no-hitter, to pitch a no-hitter, but what, as a catcher, what's your approach as you're working through these innings and you kind of get that feeling that it's it's going this direction? Can you put us there with you? Sure. So it was the first and only uh, no hitter I ever caught. It was my number one career highlight for sure. And about the sixth inning, I had a feeling something good was going to happen. It looked like we were going to win the game. And uh, Scotty was somewhat effectively wild. He had a, a turbo sinker and his slider was on. He, he wasn't necessarily spotting the ball up. I wouldn't say that we were locked in like I have been in, in many of the other games I'd caught. Uh, he would shake me off quite often, and it was just getting to the point where seventh inning, eighth inning, and then ninth inning, here we are. And you could just feel the excitement. I felt myself at a time kind of pitching for the no-hitter, calling the game for the no-hitter. It looked like we were going to win it. This was an opportunity for Scott to to actually do something amazing. And uh came down to one of my buddies here in Sacramento, Greg Vaughn. He and I would work out in the off season, And I don't know if you recall, but that last out – was a real close play in left field with uh, Alex Cole and Pat Mears, the shortstop, going after it. And, uh, you know, the ball was caught. And, I mean, I was raising my hands up, and then I realized, oh, no, it might drop. Um, but it was just – it was phenomenal. You know, it was just one of those magical moments. And then shortly thereafter, I saw the second no-hitter thrown in the Metrodome. Eric Milton threw it. And I was on the opposing team. I was with the Angels that time. So I got to see two no-hitters and be part of uh, catching Scotties in 94. So let's stick with the, the wild pitcher here. I'm going to take you back to Anaheim. Steve Sparks, how do you catch for a knuckleballer when you have no idea where that ball is going to go? And, and, like, what is your approach behind the plate when you got a knuckleballer on the mound? So it took me a while to figure Sparky out, and I played with him in Detroit as well. And for, for the first probably 15 games I caught him, he would put his Mizuno girls softball catcher's mitt on my chair. That was part of his deal. So whoever was catching would get the mitt on their chair. And I just didn't like it. It just didn't feel right. It was too flimsy, and I, I didn't couldn't get the ball out and throw it. Um, and my approach was to try and catch the ball. And then finally, and he threw it hard too. He didn't just float it up there where it was kind of coming in soft. He threw that thing in 70 mile an hour range. So it was coming in quick and hard and flat. And then at Anaheim, it was even more difficult because they're in the pitcher coming out of his release point was this great big Coors Light sign that was white and silver. And so it was just a lot of it was uncomfortable. So then I decided, well, the heck, I'm not even going to try and catch this thing. I'm just going to try and let it hit me. So then I would just move my body to where I thought if I missed it, at least it would hit my chest. And I was still pretty unsuccessful with it. But, you know, I loved catching Sparky. His, he was a gamer. Um, every now and then he'd zip that fastball in there. Um, but that knuckleball was tough. It's tough to hit. You know, it's tough to catch. It's tough to call for umpires. And you just have to trust it and relax and hope you keep it in front. But, yeah, it was it was a challenge, to say the least. One more each. Same order, guys. All right. So, Matt, I, I look at this uh, this managerial uh, resume. I mean, 2004 Midwest title, uh, Midwest League title, 2006 EL manager of the year, 2007 minor league manager of the year, 2010 EL champion and manager of the year. I mean – 
obviously things didn't go too well in you know, 2011, but uh, do you miss managing at the minor league level? And would you ever consider a return? I loved managing. It was, it was a lot of fun. I had a lot of success. I had a lot of great players when I was with Detroit. Um, Dave Dombrowski was the GM and um, Glenn Ezell was the field coordinator. They gave me a lot of freedom and ability to kind of do what I wanted to do. And it was kind of before Moneyball. So the manager had a little more say in how things were run. And um, I started reading a lot of books on leadership and, and how to get the most out of myself and the team and just had a lot of success. Um, and then as the game started to move more towards money ball, I sensed that the field manager became more of a middle man. So you were told how you had to play guys. Uh, you had to follow certain rules that you may not necessarily agree with. And so it became more of a, it just, it just didn't feel right. And then I got out of the game and I've been out of the game since 2000 after I actually got fired during the 2011 season when I went managing in Rome. I went from a ball manager, double A manager, big league third base coach for one year with the Rangers back to double A manager. I did win baseball America manager of the year for all minor league managers in 07. And then I won it again in Pittsburgh, along with the championship in Altoona in 2010. I actually got fired after that season. So that did not look good. Um, there was a lot of question about what kind of person I was, you know, how I was trying to rock the boat and things like that. And it was hard for me to, to remove that, uh, you know, that mark on me. It was unfortunate. Um, if I, I probably, looking back on it, I would have done things differently when I was with the Tigers. Um, I likely would have just turned it over to Dave Dombrowski and just said, whatever you think is best for me. Instead, I was excited to get the chance to coach in the big leagues. And I was honored to have that. It got me my 10 years uh, fully vested and then got fired right after that. Or not fired, but my contract wasn't renewed. And so things kind of went south after that. But to answer your question, the, the latter part is I'd love to get back in the game at some level, some capacity. I don't necessarily think managing would be something I'd be interested in at this point, but I do think I have a lot to offer from the perspective of having managed in the big leagues back then or, or coached in the big leagues back then as well as managed. And I've also started my own baseball academy, and I've learned to really develop younger players. And um, I've, along with my business partner, we've developed an online training app, so I've got some – some software that actually teaches kids how to play. And so I've really dug into the whole coaching thing in sort of a humble way to try and help players and things. So whatever happens, happens. I love baseball. Um, it's great to still be with my family. And yeah, I don't know. I have uh, a lot of fond memories along the way too. All right, Matt, I got a question about one of your teammates back in Anaheim in, in 1998. He's uh as I run the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame, I think of a Canadian pitcher. He's just a kid back there, Jason Dixon. He was he was 25, um, came off a good year uh, the year before, had a rough year in '98, but he pitched 122 innings, and you were the main catcher. So, what do you what what do you got about on on Jason Dixon from from '98 when you caught him? Oh, just such a great teammate. I was his personal catcher, and uh, we worked really well together. He had a a, a great curveball that uh, he could bounce a lot, and I was. I like to block balls, so I was encouraging him to continue to do that. He had a good fastball as well, and just a competitor, just one of those guys that would take the ball and just love to get out there and compete. And, um, yeah, we connected really well on the field, off the field. And, um, you know, as a catcher, I was real fortunate to have played with a lot of pitchers who I was able to connect with, and we had this sort of way to almost, like, read each other's minds during the game. And, and uh, I was able to – for the most part, calm guys down and, and get the most out of them. And Jason was a guy that was, he just trusted me and trusted his stuff. And, um, you know, Dick Pohl was our pitching coach at the time, and he uh, he helped Jason out a lot as well. And, you know, the Angels had a lot of confidence in him. But being from Canada, as you know, anytime you, you're with a Canadian and you see something on TV or you hear about this guy, it's always, oh, he's from Canada, he's from Canada, you know, so we'd always give him a hard time, especially like Getty Lee would be coming around and in Toronto or something. It was just all about that. But, uh, yeah, great guy, and, uh, you know, I have a lot of fond memories with Jay about Jason. Excellent. He's running Baseball Canada now, so he's doing a good job running the, the national program across the country. So. Yeah, I saw that. And if you, if you bump into him, or do you stay in touch with him? Pretty often. Tell him I said hi, please. Yeah, he's, sure. he was a great guy. Great. He played, you managed, and I, I don't know if she still is, but I, I know when you were growing up, your mom was a teacher. So 
my question would be about sort of the youth of sports. What advice, you know, now that you've kind of brought it full circle around to an academy, what advice do you give to parents? What's the best piece of advice to parents who are trying to maybe groom their, their child for, for professional sports or sports in general for that matter? Yeah, I, I encourage them not to groom their, their child for professional mm -hmm. sports. I encourage them to groom their child to do the best that they can at whatever it is that they're doing and to basically lead by example and just really truly appreciate watching your child play or performing or whatever it is that they're doing and avoid coaching from the stands or anything like that outside of their field of play um, and really start to visualize and see your child excelling in whatever it is that they're doing and just visualize that and see that and your the the children generally will, will feel that energy and, and perform well. The problem is a lot of the times, Paul, is that parents sometimes, not sometimes, oftentimes become attached to their child's result. And, and that, it stings the parent because they feel like they're not parenting well and they want to do whatever it is that they can to help that child play better. And then what happens is the relationship that the child has with their parent becomes sort of disjointed and they feel as though that their performance is going to, basically affect the way that their their mom or dad loves them. And so it's just ultimately just removing that attachment to their child's play and just appreciating and loving them and enjoying the fact that they can go out and play as long as they're doing their best and holding their head high. And, I, and I'll tell them, say, hey, you know, watch them hustle on and off the field. If they're a baseball player and they hit a ground ball to short, just make, if they run hard down the line and they hit the front part of the bag after the game, you know, maybe say, I really, that play, I know nobody saw, but man, you did a great job running down the line. And I saw you cheering for your teammates or even better. Yeah. Don't even say anything about the game on the way home. Just say, I just love watching you play. And, you know, just once they have that, that they let go of that attachment of their child's performance, the child's going to play better and their relationship's going to blossom. So I want to, I want to ask you this, like you mentioned Moneyball analytics has taken over the game it's it's definitely not the same game as from when I was a kid the last 15 years specifically have, have really changed do you see baseball making changes at some point to fix what has come and it's like what are your thoughts on today's game it's it's strikeout or home run it shifts it's batting averages are lower than probably ever at this point but what are your thoughts on today's game I love baseball and I always will. And there it, it's always changed. However, in the last seven or eight years, it's changed more than it had, I think in the last 30 or 40 years, at least it feels that way with the rule changes and the way the game's played. The players are better. They're definitely getting better, but the game is not being played better as a whole. Um, it's become more, not only analytical driven, but also more individual stuff, performance on the individual. And instead of offensively giving yourself up and maybe hitting the ball on the ground to the right side and moving a runner at the very least from second to third with nobody out, you've done your job. Now I don't think that's appreciated as much. Back in the old days, you go to a game and that would happen. You know, you could see the fans clapping and cheering. That's why I love going and playing in Boston and New York because they got the game. They appreciate a good play. Um, you know, catchers down on one knee, you know, they're saying, well, you know, Framing is more important than blocking. While well, I was watching the game tonight, the Yankees and the Red Sox, and I think two or three runs were scored due to the fact that a ball got by the catcher. And I'm not so sure how they measure that, but okay. Um, I still think that there's a need for the, the, the little inner inside baseball and how to play the game. And, and I think that's going to slowly over time kind of be lost and sooner or later people are going to forget about what it was to watch a game and appreciate that it was going extra innings I mean heck back in the 90s early 90s it was common for a game to be two hours you know and we could take as many visits to the mound as possible but dude we were pitching inside we were knocking guys down we were hitting guys on purpose we were taking guys out at second there was a level of fear and respect and the game was basically policed by the players so it was upon the integrity of the players to do things a certain way that the fans may had not really understood. Whereas nowadays, you know, guys are flipping their bats. 
a guy pitches inside and brushes him back and he's got armor on his arm and he's got the face mask on and the whole bit. And it's like, you can't do that anymore. So uh, I don't know. I mean, the game is what it is. I still love it. Um, I'm trying to learn about how the game's being played, but I still think there's some little things that teams can do that will help them win by being a little less selfish and a little more selfless. Just to add to that, why, it, it, just in your opinion, why can't baseball make like a star? I turn on my TV. I see LeBron James all over commercials. I see Tom Brady all over commercials. I don't see a baseball player. Like they haven't had a star since A-Rod. Like it's, it's been a while since we've, we've seen somebody on our TVs, you know, in commercials that everybody knows. It, any reason for that, do you think? Uh, well, I mean, I guess that would come down to the marketing and, and how they want to, to put those players out there. But I see Shohei Otani as, as possibly maybe one of the biggest players ever. Um, and, and I think they are kind of pumping him up to the point of just being that, that player, Mike Trout, another one. But Shohei Trout, being yeah. able to pitch and, and hit the way he does – um, is something to watch. You want it when that when the Angels are playing and he's playing. You want to put everything down and watch this guy play. I mean, the way he swings the bat and the way he throws the baseball and the way he runs uh, is something to behold. And as far as I don't know, I mean, I think the NBA and the NFL do things their way, and baseball does their things. You know, things a certain way. Um, I'm not really sure why they don't do that. I think that comes down to marketing, but. Still, I believe baseball is the greatest game. I think it's a wonderful game, and um, it's going to probably at some point, I think that pendulum might switch, go back a little bit more towards the old school. You're seeing Buck Showalter now managing. I saw him put down a bunt the other day. You know, they're kind of playing a little bit of small, but I like that, you know. Um, and so then that will start to engage the fans a little bit more and, and uh, make the game a little more exciting instead, like you said, of just waiting for the three-run home or the strikeout. DH in the National League is going to kill a lot of bunting, that's for sure, but. Yeah, but still, you know, advancing base runners is winning is winning baseball games. So we'll see. Yeah, I, I do miss the pitcher hitting. But again, the game's bigger than all of us. I've always said that and it always will be. And um, it's going to continually evolve. And um, it's still the greatest game out there. Well, I want to thank Matt Walbach, Matt Walbeck for joining us. And I appreciate you coming on. That's a good time. First catcher. We've been trying to get a catcher for a while. So I appreciate Great. that. I want Michael, to, my, Paul. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Scott and uh, Brian. Thanks for having me, guys. I really appreciate it. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I want to remind everybody, hit that subscribe button. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Have a great night.